Hello, welcome back to Beethoven's Eroica. This is the second of two modules exploring how his third symphony impacted and reshaped the classical landscape. I hope you had an opportunity to listen to the recording of the entire symphony at the end of the last module, because in this module we'll be discussing the four movements in greater detail particularly the third movement and its role and function within the entire symphony. Berger has written, the Eroica has vastly deepened and extended the emotional range of the symphony, considerably increased the size of the orchestra, and nearly doubled the length of a symphonic work. Beethoven's orchestral works were already at this time beginning to produce sounds that had never been heard before. They shocked the Viennese public, who were used to the genteel tunes of Haydn and Mozart. Beethoven's first two symphonies, outstanding as they are, still kind of look back to the aristocratic world of the 18th century, the world as it was before it was shattered in 1789. And so the Eroica represents a tremendous breakthrough, a great leap forward for music, even a revolution. Again, sounds like these had never been heard before. The unfortunate musicians who had to play the Eroica for the first time must have been shocked and completely bewildered. And we'll look at an example in the third movement where the horn players may have felt that same bewilderment. The Eroica caused a sensation. Up until then, a symphony was supposed to last at most half an hour. The first movement of the Eroica, however, lasted as long as an entire symphony of the 18th century. And yes, it was a work with a message, a work definitely that had something to say. The dissonances and the violence of the first movement are clearly a call to some sort of struggle. The first movement of the symphony, as you can see, opens with two very strong chords that resemble a man striking his fist on a table, demanding attention. Beethoven then launches into a kind of musical cavalry charge, a tremendously impetuous forward thrust that is interrupted by clashes, conflict, and struggle, and even halted momentarily by moments of sheer exhaustion, only to resume its triumphant forward march. I invite you to listen to the first movement again if you haven't heard it recently. In this movement, we're right in the thick of the revolution itself, with all of its ebbs and flows, its victories and defeats, its triumphs and despairs. It is the French Revolution in music. Imagine listening to it as one of the very first attendees at the debut concert of the Eroica. You would not have had to wait long to experience the heroic implications of Beethoven's vision. Again, these two powerful chords that you see there um, telegraph, well, they telegraph the majesty and the grandeur to follow as well. So even though it signals struggle, there's a great amount of heroism in the music. Was it heralding was it heralding some sense of Napoleonic triumph? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide.
in these opening measures, I hear defiance and struggle, but I also hear victory and triumph. The starkly contrasting second movement, a funeral march, is shrouded with somber drumbeats, and it initially seems to be an odd choice, even for the enigmatic Beethoven. Riding high from the preceding allegro, the listener is left to speculate about the meaning and the suddenness of this rather anticlimactic lament. Though the middle section of the march is less depressing, a mournful dirge eventually returns, casting a sort of inexorable darkness over the entire movement. And yet this funeral march does seem to be in memory of a hero. It's a massive piece of work, as weighty and solid as anything you can hear in the classical era. The slow, sad tread of the funeral march is interrupted by a section, again, as we said earlier, it recaptures the glories and the triumphs of one who has given his life for a revolution. The central passage also creates this massive sound edifice that creates a sensation of unbearable grief before finally returning to the central theme again of the funeral march. And this is one of the greatest music or greatest moments in the music of Beethoven or any music in my opinion. Sure enough, Beethoven awakens the dead with the surprising debut of the third movement, Scherzo. Indicated Allegro Vice, its buoyant style conjured yet another unforeseen passion, that of irrepressible joy, for which the traditional minuet, at least in the composer's view, would have been insufficiently evocative. Critics would definitely react, questioning the necessity and the purpose of this radical symphonic overhaul. Was Herr Ludwig needlessly manipulating their emotions? What could he possibly have had in mind? This is why I believe that overall, the trophy for most innovative in the Eroica would go to the Scherzo. Its rebranding influence on the architecture of the symphony was reaffirmed by the sheer frequency and manner in which others would later emulate it. The staying power of this jovial dance is best explained by the way, by the way it made the symphony more representative of the entire emotional palette. During the inner two movements of the Eroica, the heightened contrast achieved by boldly juxtaposing a somber funeral march and a light-hearted scherzo proved to be a bar-raiser in the realm of emotive authenticity. 
expanding the roster of human experiences one might feel in the concert hall, henceforth became a core symphonic objective. Some critics believe that Beethoven's first attempts to implement the scherzo were probably experimental, maybe even falling short of his intended purpose. Grove mentioned in his writings that, quote, Beethoven's original intentions on this occasion were, as usual, very wide of the result. He has got the tune, but the manner of reaching it is very different to what it afterwards became. By initially labeling the notes of the third movement as a minuet, is it possible that Beethoven was still ambivalent about making this change? Perhaps he remained conflicted about whether to be a pioneer of romantic ideals or a perfecter of classical principles. As noted earlier, Beethoven did indulge his fascination with the scherzo prior to the Eroica Symphony. In 1801, he not only used it, but actually positioned it ahead of the funeral march in his A-flat major sonata. Clearly, this was no fleeting infatuation. From the perspective of his quest to heighten the impact of the symphony and the sonata, it appears that with each iteration, Beethoven became more convinced that the inclusion of the scherzo and its order of placement in the symphony were of vital importance. What, then, explains the particular ordering here of the funeral march, followed by a scherzo, found in the Eroica. It is my belief that the funeral march preceding the scherzo should not be interpreted exclusively as a tribute to Napoleon, primarily because the emperor was not yet dead. Furthermore, because the symphony itself does not conclude with something funereal, proposing a direct biographical link between, Beto- between Napoleon's rise and fall, to the structural progression of the symphony would be a bit tenuous. More plausibly, the first movement's portrait of heroism, in my view, was meant to set the stage for the profound grief that often follows when heroism, for whatever reason, falls silent. Beethoven's sense of disillusionment with Napoleon, inasmuch as it relates to the choices he made for the second movement, contextualizes the broader sense of mourning one feels for the loss of cherished heroic ideals. Transitioning abruptly from a state of grief into one of humor and lightheartedness may seem appropriate, inappropriate. Alternatively, if the scherzo is viewed as a celebration of the inspirational elements associated with a hero's larger-than-life persona, such as laughter, loyalty, hope, protectiveness, and courage, this incongruity is diminished. Remarkably, via the scherzo, Beethoven managed to somehow reanimate these heroic traits in a form that transcended the life of the hero who once personified them. In the end, whether Beethoven was channeling Napoleon or instead portraying the dramatic peaks and valleys of his own life, or perhaps a composite of the two, the structural revisions he settled upon proved to be more compelling than if the traditional minuet had remained. Beethoven was reported to have made frequent revisions and corrections, often to the dismay of performers and audiences alike. Their frustration proved to be reciprocal. After the first public performance of his Grand Symphony, the great composer stubbornly refused to acknowledge applause from the crowd, which, according to one periodical, was deemed to have been insufficiently enthusiastic. Critics be damned, 
it is doubtful that Beethoven would have second-guessed his decision to implement the scherzo or even have regretted it placing it where it now appears. Ultimately, and to his satisfaction, the anticipatory feelings of triumph, tragedy, and elation that are expected from an endeavor as groundbreaking as the Eroica, these were compellingly portrayed in the various phases of the Third Symphony, especially the Third, which demanded a lot of all the musicians, especially the horn players. Please take a listen uh, to the clip below by clicking on the conductor. I think it is also worth noting here that the scherzo, the type of scherzo that Beethoven uh, used in the Eroica, uh, is quite different uh, from the scherzos he had used earlier, which resembled more um, resembled more those of Haydn and Mozart. You can see that the pickup note of the Anacrusis in the above example, which is from the Eroica, kind of adds to a sense of metric ambiguity. An interesting little twist. Again, if you wish to listen to the entire third movement, the box above or the link above will allow you to do that. Yes, that is none other than the great Leonard Bernstein. The fourth movement, finale, Allegro Molto, employs thematic material of obvious importance to Beethoven. Here he is actually recycling some programmatic music familiar to listeners of the Prometheus Ballet and the Twelve Dances. Emerging from a calm, pizzicato statement, the opening strains of the melody veritably bloom into a swirling tapestry of jubilation. Bolstered by the introduction of the second theme, the expanding orchestral sound further intensifies, powerfully climaxing in quintessential Beethoven fashion. Characteristically simple, yet enormously satisfying, this approach to melodic development in the finale previews the genius and the pioneering practices that his critics and admirers would later come to embrace. For Beethoven, the risk in doing these things was great, but the reward was even greater. This final movement is an entirely different spirit. The symphony ends on a note of supreme optimism. After all the defeats, setbacks, and disappointments, Beethoven seems to be saying to us, Yes, we have suffered a grievous loss, but we must now turn the page and open a new chapter. 
the human spirit is strong enough to rise above all defeats and to continue the struggle. And we must learn to laugh at adversity. Like the great revolutionaries before him, Beethoven was convinced that he was writing for uh, posterity. When, as it frequently happened, musicians complained that they could not play his music because it was too difficult, he used to answer them, Don't worry, this is music for the future. Beethoven's revolution in music was not understood by many of his contemporaries. They regarded it as bizarre, harebrained, even crazy. Audiences resented it precisely because it compelled them to think what the music was about. Instead of pleasant and easy tunes, Beethoven confronted his listeners with meaningful themes, with ideas conveyed in music. This tremendous innovation later became the basis of all romantic music. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation.